From AgriPoints, I'm James Kotecki, and this is the Point Cloud on location at the Aim for Climate Summit in Washington, D.C. And joining me is Emily Reese, CropLife International's president and CEO. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It's, it's delightful to be here in Washington. And it's been a great event so far. But first, let's just kind of contextualize CropLife International. Who are you and what brings you to Aim for Climate? So CropLife International represents the R&D sector, the innovators of the ag sector. So so we are so excited to be here at aim for c uh, We're presenting a number of projects here, but also we want to be part of this conversation because ultimately climate mitigation, climate adaptation has to happen with farmers. So talk to me more about some of the research that you are doing. Are you promoting research across the wide kind of spectrum of everything that I might assume is involved in agricultural research? Are you focused on specific areas? So for us, what we look at is how do we bring new toolboxes? How do we bring the innovation to farmers? How do we put it in their hands? Yeah. So that can be anything from the plant science that involves uh, genome editing to biotech, but also looking how do we make our crop protection solutions uh, more adapted to what farmers need need today uh, to ensure that we have better nature positive outcomes in the country for the farmers but also that we can ensure that we have enough productivity because ultimately food security with climate change is going to become a bigger challenge. And talk to me about that, I don't know if gap is the right term, but talk to me about that journey from innovation that happens in a lab or a company, and then it actually gets to a farm. Hey, look, I'm not a farmer. My understanding is if you're a farmer, you got a lot of things to do. You got a lot of things to worry about, and there's plenty of people that are willing to pitch you on the latest, newest technology that maybe you've tried some of it in the past and it didn't work, and you've only got one season to get this right, and your whole you know business is riding on it. So how do you think about that kind of adoption given that mentality and that reality for the regular farmer? So, I mean, first, coming back to the innovation part, we're talking about thousands of women and men that dedicate their lives to science, to plant science, to first bring those innovations from the lab to a point where they can come to the field. And we underestimate how many years of research goes into that to bring yeah. those innovations forward. Now, to get into the hands of farmers, you need to pass another barrier, which is that you need to have a regulatory system that allows these technologies to not be shelved and to arrive to the farmers. And then, as you said, farmers are busy people. They're running companies, small, large, and they need to make the best decisions of what works best for them to have those outcomes uh, on the farm. And that's really uh, their business decisions. Um, and uh, we're here to accompany them in that step. So what do you think the biggest challenge is? What keeps you up at night at the most? If we think about this whole chain of like an, an idea to actually getting it growing, what are the biggest, maybe not barriers, but challenges right now in that process, maybe where you're focused the most to make sure that we kind of get through any kind of potential blockages and towards the innovation that we all want to see in practice? I think we can use the word barrier. What I, to a certain extent, obsessed with is the trade element. Mm. Because ultimately today in a, a world that's changing, that's heating, where we have growing populations, big increases in populations ahead of us. We also have climate impacts. That means more droughts, more floods, more climate events, I would say, that have impact on uh, food supply. We also need to keep in mind that that means that you need to have more predictability in the flows of food from where it's uh, being produced in different parts of the world to buffer those impacts. And so when it comes to trade, what we're seeing is that with the fragmentation of the world right now, um, there's more and more barriers uh, for the movement of food. It's important to keep in mind, and it's difficult to believe this sometimes, but our global food systems have become truly global in nature. And what that means is that agricultural commodities, one third of them, will cross uh, at least borders twice hmm. before they get from the farmer to uh, either the food supplier or the end consumer. And with that, with every movement over the border, we need to make sure that we don't have borders, uh, barriers to trade, which would be unfair, discriminatory, uh, due to this fragmentation. Uh, so we need to keep food supplies moving around and we need to facilitate that trade now, especially to 
to be prepared for climate change. It's an interesting point because coming out of the pandemic, everybody started talking about supply chain and maybe more individual country kind of resiliency, making things that you need closer to where you actually need them. That's possible to a certain extent with crops, but certain things just grow well in certain areas, obviously. So we're still going to need that trade. And quite on the contrary, local and, and boosting local uh, food supply, hugely important. But I think we also have to have uh, a recognition that with these climate impacts, that's not always going to be possible yeah. and that we might have to events uh, that will mean that we will uh, need to move food more rather than less. And there's another point. What we're seeing now is that with these growing populations, with a heating planet, there are more and more countries which are becoming food dependent. Yeah. So I think that in that case, we, we need to be very cautious about these movements, these calls for food sovereignty. Many countries are unable, will be unable to go there. What we need to do is make sure that we are boosting local resilience, but also keeping trade flows open. And there's a, I don't know if it's a catch-22 there, but you also probably, presumably, want to do that movement in a, in a carbon-friendly or more carbon-friendly way, obviously, because the more that food moves around, the more that contributes to the problem that, of course, requires that movement maybe more in the first place. Well, I mean, uh, in a way, you know, when we look at uh, logistics and transport, there's a lot of the hiccups in logistics, which are, are more infrastructural, uh, which are in the hands of governments to invest in, rather than, I would say, mm -hmm. a, a question for, for farmers. But I'm sure they're yeah. paying attention to that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, final thoughts here. This is really an event that's kind of being uh, promoted and thought of as uh, something on the road to COP28. Um, your thoughts on the role and prominence of agriculture, food security, sustainability issues as we go to COP28 and talk about climate? So first, on this road to COP28, it's important to keep in mind what happened at COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh. Uh, in Sharm el Sheikh was the first time that we saw food and agriculture really strongly on this climate agenda. So it was the first recognition that agriculture plays its role not only in mitigation, but also needs to adapt now to climate change. And so moving to COP28, I'm sure that all of these themes will be uh, gaining a lot of traction and we'll see more agriculture in uh, climate rather than less. Well, Emily Rees, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us today. Thank you for having me. Crop Life International. And I am James Kotecki with AgriPoints. We are here at the Aim for Climate Summit in Washington, D.C. And this is The Point Cloud. <laughs>